Welcome to Cam Can Drum. This is Q&A with Cam Can Drum, and I have a special guest, Mike Lewis, today. Mike, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Cool, man. So, uh, Mike, I kind of went and creeped on your channel a little bit. I saw that you started in 2013. Is that well, more like a thing where you just like to watch videos and then you started putting your own videos in later? Yeah, I like 2013, I think, is when I got a Gmail address. <laughs> uh i didn't actually start posting like i posted one thing early on where uh I had the, the default alarm on my iphone back like many many years ago kept making me think of the intro to enema by tool so i put them together and made a thing called tool alarm and then uh i did nothing for like eight years or something <laughs> like that so i only started posting really in february of 2021 22 22 february cool. 22 yeah 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 so, I, I uh a i think i i remember you coming onto the scene and um yeah you just your channel stands out not just because of um your i guess i'll say unorthodox setup but also because you have some really eclectic music going on and you're just an amazing drummer so you kind of stood <laughs> out when you know a lot of us uh back in the day where we were in like these Google Plus groups and um, back in like 2017 or so. So it was kind of stagnant for a while and then guys would pop up here and there. And I just remember you coming up and seeing your videos and I was like, wow, this guy's really good. I gotta somehow in, in you know, the future interview him so that, you know, everyone can get to know you better. Um, oh, so yeah, that's, that's awesome. I appreciate you checking it out. Yeah, so uh, I I just heard you say out. Oh, are you a Canadian? Yeah. Yes. Yes, I am. I didn't realize I gave myself away so easily. <laughs> yeah, I'm from. Uh, well, technically, I'm from Regina, Saskatchewan, and then uh, I grew up in Winnipeg, and now I live in a small town north of Winnipeg, in the middle of absolutely nowhere, which wow. is great. I'm not complaining at all. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I am up here in the frozen wastelands of the 51st state. Nice. Are you, um, so me being a hockey fan, are you at all into hockey? You ever play? You watch? It's like there's a legal requirement to get your Canadian citizenship. Even if you're born here, you have to play at least one year of hockey. If you don't, you go to what they call the penalty box, but other people call it the Yukon and you have to spend <laughs> a year up there. So yeah, I, uh, I learned how to play hockey when I was like five and then played it all the way through until I guess uh, my mid twenties, and I haven't played it much since. My daughter's into it, so sometimes I'll play like hockey in the driveway with her. But uh, that's about it. Cool. So, are Are you a Jets fan? Hockey teams. No, God, no. Uh, Winnipeg <laughs> Jets confirmed, but um, just because I grew up in Winnipeg doesn't mean I liked it. But uh, no, my favorite hockey player growing up was Ray Bork, so I was always cheering for the Boston Bruins and Mike Bossy from uh, the Islanders. Yeah, cool. uh, back in the day, they like guaranteed 50 goals a season there. I forget how many seasons he did in a row. It was like four or seven or something. But yeah, those those two teams, the Islanders and the Bruins. And then I haven't followed hockey much in the last decade or so. I mostly just check into the playoffs. And uh, I'm always happy to see Winnipeg losing to anyone. And <laughs> uh, and then, yeah, I just sort of, sort of keep tabs here and there. But honestly, I don't think I could name a, a player right now in the NHL. It's all the turnover has been insane. And at, like I checked in this year, and I'm like, why is there more than 30 teams? I think the last time I looked, there was 25. when I started watching hockey, I think there was like 14, maybe 16 teams. And like, I remember when the San Jose Sharks became a thing and everyone like freaked out because their jerseys were so ugly. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Hockey's been a like, even though I don't play it all the time, it is undeniably a huge part of just living up here. Even just being able to have conversations with other people when you're in line at Tim Hortons or something. I think that's the most Canadian thing I ever just said ever. Just yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, uh, that's, that's, that's me and hockey basically. Cool. I was never yeah. good at it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess uh, down here in the States, it, it would be uh, equated to football and I don't know anything about football. So um, you, you're, you're better off up there than I am down here. That's for sure. Sports wise. Well, sports wise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But our Sports. common, uh, co our common love is for um, music and and drums in particular. But 
And I have to, I'm sorry that I have to do this, but I tried to um, click on your Bandcamp on your uh, uh, your YouTube channel and it, I just got the the spinning wheel. I, I wasn't able to to get to there, but it, it um, disconcerting. obviously, yeah, obviously you, uh, and I think I've seen it on your Instagram too. You have, you don't just play drums, you play all the instruments, right? Yeah, I mean, with varying degrees of proficiency like drumming is obviously my you know a instrument bass would be the second one like that's the only other instrument i've ever played professionally like gone on tour and you know earned a paycheck by not being bad at it <laughs> um i can play guitar but i would never bill myself as a guitarist it's mostly a writing tool um although i'm I have an, enough of an understanding now of like chord structure and music theory that the guitar has stopped being mystifying. Like when I started playing guitar, I did the Paige Hamilton thing of like drop D and it was like, look, I can play a chord with one finger and that's super fun. But um, a number of years ago, I started into a project where I had to start playing in standard tunings and all of a sudden it just made sense to me. So I understand the guitar fairly well, but I can't shred on it or anything. Yeah. I can write chord progressions, try to figure out better sounding chords than just doing the, you know, the root and fifth, but that's about it. And then with keyboards, again, same thing. I have uh, like a reasonable level of technical understanding of the instrument, but I'm in no danger of putting Jordan Rudas out of work. <laughs> uh, like I, most of my keyboards, like I'll come up with it and then I'll just program what I came up with because I can't necessarily move from chord to chord very well. So but yeah, drums and bass, I, I don't feel ashamed earning money for those. The other two, I would feel like I ripped somebody off. Awesome. Well, so uh, for anyone watching that can't get to your band camp, it, um, how do how would we like go go about searching for you and finding you there? Well, I got to go check that then, which is the first <laughs> thing I'm going to do when this interview is over, because I thought everything was fine. Um, the, on my Instagram, it's in the in the bio there. There's a little link tree to the YouTube channel and to my Bandcamp. So I don't have the biggest social media presence right now. That's something that I keep meaning to sign up for Facebook, and there's something inside of me that keeps screaming "Don't," um, just because I used to be on there, and it's just it's a bunch of middle aged people bickering over nothing, and I'm just like, eh. but I do like Ash Wells and a couple other folks who have a good community going uh, had recommended signing up for Facebook. And I, I keep meaning to, I wanted like, I'm not dismissing their idea. I just, for some reason, it's one of those things where the, you know, your head's about to hit the pill. Oh, you didn't sign up for Facebook today. Yeah. <laughs> it's sort of how things go for me these days. It's like, Oh, you had eight things you had to get done today. You only finished five. And then yeah. that's about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> cool. Well, or um, yeah, but you so, can go to Mike Lewis. Mike, if you just type in Mike Lewis, but M Y K E, uh, Mike Lewis music, I think you'll probably get to my band camp. Or if you type in Mike Lewis Hecaton Kyries, I'm pretty sure I'm the only person with an album named that. Um, that should take you to the band camp as well. Uh, I'm also on Spotify and iTunes if you want to look that stuff up. Although I don't know, I'm going to be really doing that with my next record. I think I might just make it a band camp and YouTube thing and leave it at that. Because the stream, well, streaming service is a whole other rant. Get yeah. on to your next question. Well, I'm glad that you uh, said your album cover because I, I looked at it and I was like, how in the world do you say that? Well, that's the that's the original painting back there. My, uh, my ex-wife uh, did that. She's actually, despite being my ex-wife, I can still say she's an extremely talented person. And uh, she did a hell of a job on that. Uh, I'm very grateful that I got that in the divorce. Didn't get anything else, but I got that. <laughs> but um, yeah, I uh, if you uh, see the cover on the internet, it's pretty striking. So yeah, cool. Anyway, awesome. Well, um, let's get into some drum related questions. I'm sure everyone yep. wants to know uh, how long have you been playing drums? Thirty three years. Nice. Although I, sh I should clarify, I've owned a drum set and been a drummer for 33 years. I haven't been drumming for that long because there's been long stretches where I was living in an apartment and rehearsal space is, is very hard to find in Winnipeg, like really hard because people guard it very jealously. And I don't blame them for it because it, it's just there's not many spaces and people tend to form like a really tight knit group of like, OK, we're only going to let people in from this group and this one will do the same thing but from a different group. 
And it's again, it's understandable. You got like 40 bands fighting for like six spots. So yeah. it's very hard to find rehearsal space. And so there would be like four or five years at a, a time where I wasn't touching the drums at all. So I did the math on it. And I think I've really only been drumming for about 15 or 16 of those 33 years. Wow. I, that's why I learned how to play the bass. There was like my first two year stretch. I was going nuts, not doing something musical. So I just went down to the local music store. I was living in Vancouver at the time. And I just bought a bass and a little tiny amp and came back to my apartment and started figuring out scales and wasn't having nearly as much fun as I was with the drums. But I'm glad I did it because it gave me an appreciation for how the bass works and made me a better drummer for bassists to play with. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Anyway. Cool. Um, yeah, I've never noticed watching your videos. Do you use uh, or have an affinity for one or the other uh, wood or nylon tip sticks? I like nylon. Um, it's funny, I was just thinking about that this morning. Uh, I normally use nylon, uh, Vic First 3A specifically. Um, but I found since the, the the pandemic that you cannot get nylon tip sticks, or at least not the kind that I use in this oh. country uh, at all. So I've switched to wood by necessity, uh, or I guess circumstance rather than by choice. I like the nylon because you get a little better definition out of the hi hat and the ride, and I don't mic those. Like I'll, I just have the drums okay. and then overheads, okay. and that's yeah. it. So my hi hat's getting picked up by the room mics basically, and the nylon tips made that a lot cleaner. Whereas now, like I got to play a little bit harder to get more definition. Out of it. Hey, it's not the end of the world or anything, but that's my explanation about that. Oh, that's cool. I like um, when guys get into the details and. You know, you can, I can really sense that you have a good ear because you are, you, you can tell the difference between the nylon and the wood on your recordings. Most people are just don't really pay attention to that type of thing. But, you know, I like to geek out on that stuff. I've mm -hmm. had um, people say how good my sound is on my videos and your sound is, is right up there too, man. It's like, I just love hearing the evolution of all drummers, you included, and it just mm. seems like you're every every video is just getting a little bit better and a little bit better. So I think it's because you're paying attention to those details, I think, is why it's it's getting there. Well, it's good. It, I, I do pay attention. I mean, I geek out about this stuff. Sorry, I got to watch my language. Um, but I've also gotten good advice from various friends. Like uh, the last band I, I used to work for were called Wilt. Uh, they're still and They just put out a new record actually this week. It's really good. Uh, if you like black metal. I mean, I played on their last two records. I played bass on the first one and then uh, drums on the most recent one. And um, they're a great band to check out. But their guitar player, uh, Brett, is really good at recording. He records their records. He mixes them and everything. And he's taught me a lot of things to look out for. So, Brett, if you're watching this, thanks. And um, and then again, like watching drummers like you or uh, Trey Bledsoe is another guy whose drum sound I really, really like. Mm -hmm. And I've seen you guys in interviews where you're talking about, oh, I do this and I do that. And I'm stealing all of your ideas all the time. Great. Awesome. And, uh, <laughs> it, and uh, yeah, like I just sort of cobble things together by trial and error and then listen to folks uh, like you and, and Brett. And um and again, a lot of times, it, sometimes it's accidental. Like the other day, even, I just realized that I've been choking my toms too much. So I released uh, the noise gate a little bit and I brought some more of the low end back in. And all of a sudden, my floor toms sound amazing. And I'm just like the next, um, the first time you're going to hear them properly, it's going to be two Fridays from this Friday. <laughs> or I guess, depending on when you post this, it probably won't make any sense. So I got it. <laughs> but yeah, I've got like now all of a sudden like, oh, this sounds good. The other problem though is that I'm mixing through uh those little little iPod AirPod bead uh earbud uh, things. Yeah. But the they're broken. <laughs> so on the right hand side, I can only get the low end. And on the left hand side, the high end is uh, like it's distorted because it's dying. So I mostly just hear low end and I mix based on that. And then people keep saying, Hey, it sounds great. I'm like great okay yeah. <laughs> i'll take your word for it but i'll go back and i'll listen to it through like my laptop speakers or something and and i'm like oh okay it sounds nice and crisp because i don't hear that in the earbuds and then with my actual studio monitors the room i'm in right now as you can see the ceiling isn't done yet 
So I've got like a furnace and laundry machines going and there's a lot of white noise and it washes out a lot of what I'm trying to listen to. So I don't even use the studio monitors right now. But in a couple of months, I will be finishing the, the basement in and closing off this room and making it sound a lot nicer. But it has been an evolution. When I look back at some of my older videos, it's like, geez, that oh, sounds yeah. horrible. <laughs> what was I yeah. thinking? I know. I've been there, too. I, I wish I could just delete all of that stuff. <laughs> um, let's see. I, I, I already know you, you use the double pedal. I, I actually want to talk about your setup because I think it's really unique and I it looks like it's really easy to play. At least you make it look easy to play. <laughs> How did you come up with that set? Have you been playing it? I, I, I kind of remember at the beginning of your channel, you had more of a traditional setup and now you have like the Hyatt's in the middle, kind of like um, Danny Carey does, I think, or who? who, who does it's that? been a, I've been back and forth with it a lot uh, for a number of reasons. The first time I tried doing it this way was uh, like uh, two, almost 20 years ago. I saw Bill Bruford. Uh, oh, okay. I didn't know Danny Carey did it until later. I'm not saying that guy isn't an influence on me. He is. But I got the center hi-hat idea from this Bill Bruford uh, ad for Tama, uh, whatever line of Tama he was playing at the time. And it was in Modern Drummer. Remember that magazine? Oh, I used yeah. to read that obsessively. Yeah. Uh, my marks in school like dropped because I would have it inside like my textbooks and I'd just be <laughs> memorizing drum kits. But anyways, um, but yeah, I saw that and I thought, man, that makes a lot of sense. And one day I just, I tried it and I actually took it on tour when I was throwing this dance band across Canada and man, it was like, I could be asleep and play like this, this is amazing. But then you try to learn rush songs and you're like, Oh, I hate this. And you go back to the regular thing because it's, that's the biggest challenge is, is relearning stuff for this like if i'm learning stuff like new stuff it, it you know you're growing with the song so it doesn't matter as much but um trying to take that first 20 years and adapt it to this that's the biggest like you know um mental challenge really like learning old rush songs and having to go like there dude dude but instead of just going dude, dude, like that <laughs> yeah and you know after a while what you start to realize is that you know you're never going to sound like Neil Peart. No one's going to sound like, like, you can sound close, but Neil sounds like Neil. You just got to do it your way, but still mm -hmm. faithful to the song. So, like, I've got um, this Friday, uh, after this interview, anyways, it's the last song from Nine Inch Nails is Broken. And then I'm starting a Rush record, uh, Presto, playing that all the way through. I've got almost all of it filmed, but the fills are the same, but it don't. they're not on the same drum, so hopefully people don't roast me for that, but... <laughs> I tried to get the parts right. And then you just sort of just accept the fact that like, you know, you don't have the concert toms like four of them to choose from. So you got to make your 12 inch toms sound like 12 different things. And yeah, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, <laughs> but yeah, this setup, sorry to get back to your original question. This setup is extremely comfortable to play once you get used to it, which took a couple weeks because you really got a muscle memory is really, really hard to battle against sometimes. But once you get used to it, it's extremely easy because you've got, you can focus on ambidexterity more because you've got all your options right there in front of you. So I can leave with the right or the left, um, you know, and it's, I, I've been really happy with it. The biggest challenge is getting my mind over the fact that I don't do fills like this anymore. Now it's, you know, do, 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 do. like I alternate the Mike Mangini way. And um, yeah, once you get used to it, it's super fun. The other thing, too, and this is the last part of this answer, I swear, um, is I screwed up my elbow real bad back in February because over Christmas I was getting surgery to get my gallbladder out. And then I spent January not drumming because you got to let everything heal. And then I had this dream theater request for the song Enemy Inside that somebody had requested. And I felt bad about how long it was taking me to, like, avoid learning the song because I just kept putting <laughs> it off. I was like, no, I'm scared. I'm scared. I don't want to. And then finally, I was like, I'm going to do this. And then dove, dove right in with very little warming back up. And now I've got tendonitis like crazy. It's getting better. But it, the last three or four months, it's been really quite painful. Um, and putting and I, I went, I did the Mangini setup right. Four hi-hats, two on each side there for in that cover. When you see the, the covers with the green drums in front, that's where I went. Like, I just threw everything I had on one kit to just play some of these songs that needed more toms. I've since gone back to this, but I film things out of sequence. So it's going to look like I change it every week. So I, I don't, 
I just film things out of order. Like I filmed my video for Christmas like a month ago. So <laughs> like, just as an example, um, I don't do things chronologically. But yeah, this is ultimately the one that's working the best. It's just it's been the easiest on my arm, uh, the least amount of pain on my elbow. And um, I'm still able to to work on my left side because that's my weak side. So I would recommend this to anybody, really. Yeah, it's super fun, super fun. It's a bit of a pain in the ass to set up. I'm not going to lie. But once you get past that, it's it's awesome. I, I got to give kudos to you, man. I um, My house went in and had a flood what, what, almost three years ago now. And it took me two years to set up a different set. And I everything's traditional. So mm -hmm. um, I don't have to worry about odd setups or anything like that. And then I only wanted to use this for a couple of songs and then go back to my black set. But this thing has just, just been sitting up there just because I don't have the... I don't have the patience or anything to like set up and tear down. Like I, I'm sure, you know, um, Earl, Earl Bennett. Yeah. It's, it seems like he's got a different setup every single video. And it's like, I, I, I just can't, I, I wish I had. Amazing, that yeah. guy always sounds amazing. Yeah. Always. He's one of my yeah. favorite YouTubers to watch. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like his hi hat. He always has the right hi hat and ride for every song he covers. And it's yeah. snare. He's, got, he's able to do that. Um, but he's got that. You've got a like a killer like '90s, early 2000s sound where everything's like really crisp. And your ride symbol, like I would break into your house and steal your ride symbol. I'm telling you. <laughs> but uh, Earl's got that '70s sound, like locked down with that like thud kind of snare. Oh, I love it. I love it. Yeah, yeah. He's one of the guys that I um, took some advice on, and um, he's real big on the the big hole and centering the mic right in the bass drum and then just putting oh. a pillow in there. And he's just gets this thud and it just kicks you in the chest type of bass drum. Um, so I did that to, to the black set. Um, and yeah, it, it works. You just cut a big hole, not this little hole off to the side, big mm -hmm. hole right in the center, put the bass drum mic right in the middle of the bass drum. And it just, I don't know, it just works. <laughs> That's so funny the way these things like come and go like that. Because when I started out in 1990, my first kit had the the hole in the middle. It was, like, it was big enough for my cat to get in and out of there all the time. <laughs> which I learned the hard way, much to her uh, uh, resentment, I guess. Because I sat down and just hit the bass drum and my cat comes flying. I'm like, oh, I didn't know she... Okay, I'm going gonna, gonna to check for the cat before I drum from now on. But yeah, I had that until 2000 when I got this kit. And now I've got the, you know, the little hole off to the side and everyone was all about getting that sound to get really focused and you're going to get that punch. And uh, now people are going back to the big one in the middle. Go figure. My sidekick, which I don't have on here right now because I had my rack broke and I haven't resolved that issue yet. So right now I'm using my old Yamaha uh, triple Tom holder things, which are from like 1999. <laughs> uh, never throw out gear because you never know. But um yeah, my 18-inch sidekick, which is actually my floor tom, I, I don't even have a hole in the front of it right now. Uh, so it's got a very, like, um, very old-school, jazzy kind of sound to it. Whereas a contrast to my uh, 22 by 16, which just sounds like, you know, a tank punching someone in the face, <laughs> which I like. I mean, I love this drum set. This is my favorite drum set ever. But uh, anyways, um, but yeah, Earl, what was I going to say? Earl was awesome. And then... I was talking about your sound and now i can't remember what we were talking about <laughs> <laughs> that's fine i got some other questions that um okay. i'm sure everybody wants to know uh okay i think i might know the answer but i probably i don't know well i'll just see if you could play on any one famous drummer's kit whose would it be neil peart's kit from the hold your fire tour Oh, specific. Okay. Uh, as seen cool. on the, the Show of Hands uh, album. Although, although close second would be Graham Broad's kit from the Roger Waters show in Berlin in 1990, where they did the, the whole big production of the wall uh, okay. at Potsdamer Platz to commemorate the, the fact that the Berlin Wall had come down months earlier. Um, that was the first time I saw uh, like a hybrid kit where he had, you know, a normal kind of acoustic kit, you know, two rack toms, two floor toms, kick snare. 
And then he had a Simmons pad in place of like where you would normally put a like a 10 inch rack tom or something. And I thought that was kind of cool. But then to his left, he had this D drum and Simmons mixed kit where he had the snare and then he had three D drum pads and then three Simmons pads and then a ride cymbal and the crash. And then you can watch it on the video, but I remember just watching that going like, oh, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. And then I saw Neil Peart's 360 kit uh, a couple of years later when I discovered Rush. And then, yeah, to the to this day, that's still my favorite of his setups. Just all those Simmons pads everywhere. I know they're horrible for your wrists, but man, I would give anything to have a Simmons kit. I would like if they could redo Simmons pads and keep the hexagonal shape, but with mesh heads, I, oh, I would yeah. like shut up and take my money. <laughs> I, I would buy so many of those things. Yeah, I but, remember the uh, first yeah. time I saw Simmons Kid, I think was uh, an NXS video. Oh, he, yeah. He played all just Simmons. And that was like. Yeah, he had those, those super shallow Pearl Toms. Like, I don't know. Like, I, he's <laughs> the only person I ever saw use them. But I remember that. What was his name? Tom Ferris? John Ferris? John, John Ferris, yeah. John Ferris, yeah. And then, yeah, he had the Simmons pads up top like that. I was, yeah, I always thought that was really cool. I like NXS. I probably yeah. should cover them one of these days. <laughs> but uh, no, I did. Like I'm, I grew, I was born in '78, so I like the whole '80s, '90s. Like I saw the whole thing, and I remember in excess fondly. Huh? You're uh, what? What? Um, what month? June. June. Ah, oh, I'm July. Oh, you're a month older than me. <laughs> yeah, happy birthday, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Happy birthday. Um, you're from the same year. Yeah, same year. Batch. Oh man, yeah, we're so, we're, so we're two old got, farts. You've had a front row seat to the decline, huh? Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Jeez, it's been going on for a while now. Where you're just like, man, I am the guy on the lawn saying, "Get off my lawn, damn yeah. kid." And I've been that guy since I was a teenager. Yeah. But um, but yeah. Anyways, blah blah blah. <laughs> I'm thinking about cool. The other the other uh, drummer whose kid I would like to play on actually. Uh, is uh, Chris Witten, who's my other favorite. Oh, shoot, I got another one, too. Chris Brenna on Nine Inch Nails from the Self-Destruct Tour in 94. Like, you can watch it at Woodstock. Um, I would I would play that kid, man. Yeah, Chris Brenna is one of my favorite drummers. Um, him and Neil Peart are like... Chris Brenna is like the industrial, like, electronic drumming version of Neil Peart. Like, it's just... The stuff that guy does, I, I had no real appreciation for what you could do with a hybrid setup until I saw that uh, Nine Inch Nails set in, um, yeah, 94, when they played Woodstock 94. And you, they got some camera angles where you're like, you suddenly realize, wow, he's playing the main beat with his left foot in the verses and then switching to his right foot in the choruses. And it's like, you know, the, a lot of those moments where you're just like, I didn't know that was even an option. And then you start incorporating that into what you do. And yeah, Chris Frenna does not get enough credit as a drummer, I mean. Uh, yeah, I wish that I could get drum cam footage of him playing from that tour, but I don't know that it exists. But definitely check out the the Woodstock 94 set because it's just like in the songs Closer, on the song Suck, and in the song Happiness and Slavery, you really see like him doing crazy approaches to the kit where like just play, using your body in ways you would never really think to in order to play multiple things at the same time that normally machines do. It's just, oh man, I still watch that concert all the time where I'm just like, who is this guy? How did he figure this out? <laughs> yeah. I'm sitting back here just to put rubbing two sticks together trying to make an orchestra. But yeah, uh, Chris oh. Renner's kid from that and Neil Peart's from that Show of Hands album. And then uh, Graham Broad. And then yeah, Chris Witten who played Dire Straits and Paul McCartney back in the late 80s, early 90s. And uh, his kit sounded just like on the, uh, his kit on the, Dire Straits is on the night album was like sort of the defining sound for me when I decided what I wanted to sound like. Um, he had a Noble and Cooley kit. I have no idea what the tom sizes were. I'm going to guess it was 10, 12, 13, 16, but Chris, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> and then I know he played K. He's the guy that got me hooked on K Dark Crashes. And I have a this ride right here is a 20 inch K heavy ride. I worked three paper routes for a year to get it. And it's the same ride he was using on that tour. And it's been my main ride for like uh, almost 30 years now. And um, yeah, that guy was hugely responsible for what I wanted drums to sound like. So 
Awesome. Although to be fair, God, I play on everybody's drum set. I just love drum sets. <laughs> yeah, I, they're like puzzles. They're like they're physical <laughs> manifestations of a person's priorities. If you really stop and you think about it, because everyone wants their thing right there, right in front of you, and then after some point, you got to make compromises, right? Because you can't have your ride and your china and your snare and your tom in one spot. It's you know we're not doing quantum drumming yet, but then you get to see like what's important to people and how they like try to translate this like amorphous set of ideas into a physical thing. I just find drum sets fascinating. Yeah. Like that's I, I when I was a kid in modern drum I'd get the modern drum magazines, half the time I wouldn't even read the interviews. I would just look at the drum sets and be like, oh I never thought of doing this or I never thought of doing that. Which is why guys like Peart and Chris Renner were so like mind blowing to me. Anyways, I could go on for about 10 hours boring the hell out of people about this. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I think I see some sort of electronic device back there. Do you have pads or triggers yeah, or anything? Yeah, um, I do. What I've got here, uh, let me just see, because right now it's it's backwards up there right now. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, I've got an SPD-SX uh, right there. And then um, on the floor plugged into that, R2 uh, KT10 trigger pedals. I also have a KT9, which is like a hi hat. You can use it as a kick if you want, but I just I don't have it plugged in right now because so I haven't had any need for it for the covers. Um, I will be using it on my next record of my own stuff, but we're not there yet. I'm, I'm finishing a record right now. Actually, the, um, my computer is actually upstairs because I wanted some sunlight. And I've been synth programming all week and I've got uh, one and a half songs left to do. And then the record is basically done and I want to have it out in October. And then the record after that is where I'm going to be using the KT9 stuff. But that's it for electronics, really. I, I use a, uh, a standard. Hold on. Uh, to wrap up on thing. Yeah, I got it's one of these mm. on my okay. kick yeah. playing a sample of my kick. Oh. So I, uh, <laughs> The last time when I made the the Hecaton Kyrie's record there, um, I, I had the, the guy recording me just to record individual samples. So I've got like a whole library of this kit recorded professionally. And then I, uh, yeah, I just throw my, the, the kick from that. I was thinking about even like giving it away. If I reach a thousand subscribers, just be like, here, have my drum set. I don't, know. I don't know if anybody, people seem to really like my snare a lot. So I was thinking of giving away like at least the snare pack because there's like 16, I think, and it's all, you know, loud to quiet and you can program it into whatever zones you want. That's, that's still a bit of a mystery to me. So I'm not going to tell people how to do it, <laughs> but yeah, that's it for electronics. Just that trigger and then uh, the SPDSX and the, the pedals. I want to get like a couple of just those old, you know, the PDAs, like the standard circle rubber pad to put over on that side and uh, whatnot because right now everything's on the left so that way i've got options on both sides but we're not there yet so but a boy can dream yeah <laughs> sure can um well that's cool yeah i was i was gonna ask you i think you might have answered it but you you don't record your own stuff you go to somebody to, to have it no I, I record my own stuff oh okay i do um when it, like for my drum covers, I record and mix everything myself. Uh, but I, like I've gotten advice from people who I know who do recording, like the friend of mine, Brett, that I mentioned. Um, and when it comes to making like my proper records, uh, I will go um, like I, I had Brett do all the reamping, for instance, for the bass and the guitar. And I'm going to get him to master this next record. But for the one after that, um, that one I'm actually going to try to do myself. Like I've reached a level of confidence because of the drum channel. And hopefully people aren't lying to me when they say I sound good because yeah. it's made me believe in myself. <laughs> so anyways, uh, I'm going to try to record it all here myself and get as far as the mixing stage and then have some, because I still don't totally understand mastering. So have them do that. And then, uh, and mostly, and there's a number of reasons for that. It's not that I don't like working with other people. I actually really like working with other people. But it, it's more of a, a cost cutting measure. And uh, also like it's a time issue. So I find when I go into studios, I'm kind of like, okay, let's get it done. You know, and then you just you go, 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 go until you're done. And you just want to get the hell out of there because it's expensive. And uh, you don't want to have to add another day of $500 to pay a guy watch you fail. So 
Um, so being able to like spend a whole day, you know, monkeying around with guitar pedals and be able to use my amp setup and all of this, that's, that would be lovely. Uh, that might also be a gigantic black hole that I will never come out of, but <laughs> who knows, but I'm going to, yeah, get this built, uh, at the end of August and then sometime between then and Christmas, I'm going to build an isolation booth to put amps in. And so I can work on vocals a little more. Uh, I can't sing to the level that you can. I've done like yelling and metal bands before, but, um, but singing is something like I, I kind of want, I want to work on. And now that I understand the range of my voice, I always used to try to sing up high, like where you sing in that register. And then one day it just occurred to me and every, all these interviews you see with singers is that they sing in the range that they speak. You know what I mean? Like it, with it, with notable exceptions, like say Bruce Dickinson or Jeff Tate or something. Yeah. But the average singer sings more or less in the range that they talk. And I was like, I need to start singing way lower. And I started working on that and it started not sounding terrible. So having a vocal booth to work in would be nice too. So we'll see what happens. My next record's instrumental, so I don't have to worry about singing. <laughs> no one has to worry about hearing it for a while. <laughs> Man, that's that's so awesome. It, I just love, I don't know, I love listening to stories of, well, not just drums, but just guys that can do more than one instrument. It, it, you have like a different perspective, I think, than just a, a single instrumentalist or like if you're just a drummer or if you're just a guitar player or whatever. You have just a different outlook on on not just how to play your instruments, but how they work together and yeah it's just really cool just hearing you um you know work things out in your head and and what goes you know with things and what goes against things it, it, i just love hearing you i could probably listen to you talk for all day <laughs> i have proof that people can't do that uh huh. i will talk all day but they won't listen all day uh, <laughs> no i i find like learning other instruments um initially came about because as i said i wasn't drumming but i still wanted to do something musical and i mean i've always liked the bass guitar guys like peter Steele from typo negative or billy gold from faith no more just made look they made that instrument look so cool you know and it was fun to learn to play i still like playing it um and with guitar i mean the guitar is my favorite instrument this is the thing i should have been a guitar player but <laughs> It, the guitar, the, the physical act of playing the guitar lacked the emotional intensity that I needed because I was a very high strung kid. And uh, the drums were, that was just, it was tailor made for who I was as a human being because it just was like, it gave me the place to get all of that out, you know, whereas guitar is my, and I, I, I love guitar. It was the first thing that drew me to music with guitar solos. And um, yeah, I just, I, like I every my favorite part on every Rush record is a guitar solo, not a drum part. But the drums is just I don't know me and the drums just happens. <laughs> I saw that uh, I saw the video for Money for Nothing. The when I was a kid, I remember exactly where I was. It was in my friend's living room. We were playing toys, and his mom was keeping an eye on us because we were like six, and uh, she was watching the show called Video Hits, which was like I think a precursor to VH1. Uh, and we like we had much music, but much music like, like you guys had MTV first, and then we got much music up here. But much music was still like a special order station, and you uh, couldn't like just get it with your cable. For instance, that didn't happen until almost the I think the late eighties. But uh, we were watching this show called Video Hits, and I remember the the video for Money for Nothing comes on. It's got that drum solo at the beginning by Terry Williams. The rest of the song was played by Omar Hakim, but Terry Williams did the the drum solo. And I just remember something like seeing that. And again, he had one of those kits that had like the Simmons pads and then these huge Ludwig drums, right? Now that I'm remembering it. And it something clicked in my brain. I'm like, that's what you're going to do for the rest of your life, whether you like it or not. <laughs> and I was just dove in head first. My parents didn't let me get a drum set for another five or six years, five years. But uh, I did start piano lessons, which I'm glad I did. And then uh, finally, I tricked them into getting me a drum kit. Or at least I thought I tricked them. I found out recently that, no, they knew all along that I was lying to them. Oh, wow. Because <laughs> I told them I, I got the job in grade seven playing drums, but I just did marching snare drum, right? And so the teacher says, get a practice pad and some drumsticks and you're all set. 
And I came home. I'm like, Mom, Dad, I'm in the drummer in the band, and I have to have a full drum set. <laughs> and then they're like, Oh well, okay. And to their credit, they got me one. And like they rented me one for four months, and I played it every day. And when they saw I was serious, they got me a real drum set, which was Yamaha Power V kit. And uh, I had that for ten years, and then traded it in for these guys. I uh, I don't have nearly as much gear as some people do. Like I, my buddy um, Michael Jade from austin he's got like six drum kits and he's always like maybe i should get another one i'm like i have two <laughs> give me three of yours if you want to get rid of them so bad um <laughs> but yeah i uh um yeah saw the video and then it was five years later of me bugging my parents and then they finally took me seriously and here we are 33 years later are your parents uh musicians at all no well uh my mom i mean she like played an instrument when she was a kid so she has like an understanding of it and she likes music and my like my parents were both music fans um they were into a lot cooler music before they became parents i'll tell you that because when they became parents jesus Christ. <laughs> but prior to that i mean like when i found out i think i was in my 20s when i found out my mom owned black sabbath records and it was just like where was this you know, you're upstairs listening to Reba McIntyre and Juice <laughs> Newton, and I've got Black Sabbath down here doing nothing. And then, you know, my dad was into like classic rock, like Hendrix and The Doors and Zeppelin and Pink Floyd. Pink Floyd was the first thing I got into. And to my parents' credit, like if, when I found cover art that I found interesting, which in the case of The Wall, I mean, I don't know if you've seen the gatefold for that, but it's just crazy. Mm -hmm. And to a four year old, I was like, whoa. And so, my parents would always put the record on and let me play with my toys while I listened to the stereo. Um, but yeah, they they weren't musicians uh, when I was a kid. My dad played bass in a band in high school, and but that was it. Like I never actually saw him play an instrument in my whole life. Um, my brother can kind of play guitar, but he never really like he's never really pursued it seriously. And that's been it. I've been the uh, anomaly. Like, I don't think any of my cousins are musicians. I don't think any of my aunts and uncles are musicians. Yeah, I'm the weirdo. So <laughs> Nice. There you go. <clears throat> um, I think I'm going to ask one more uh, drum question, and then we'll move on to something else. Uh, let's see. OK, I guess I ask this one all the time. If you could be Dr. Frankenstein and combine parts of different drummers what parts would you take and create this monster drummer oh man jeez well okay this might be a long answer <laughs> i would want uh neil peart's brain mm -hmm. which then i would take chris renner's brain and just like shove it in there and just have a brain <laughs> pile i would want gosh let me think about this now i would want the groove and cleanliness of Aaron Comes of the Spin Doctors. Even though I don't like the Spin Doctors, that guy's a wicked drummer. I would want the swing of Vinnie Paul. Uh, man, is that guy was a killer drummer. And so Gene Hoagland. I would want the feet of Gene Hoagland. Because um, that guy, I don't know if you're familiar with anything he's done, but wow. Uh, his work with Strapping and Lad is phenomenal. He played on Fear Factory's Mechanized record, but don't tell him that because he'll get really mad about it. Uh, he played for Death, uh, like back in the 90s. He played on, um, oh, I can't remember if it was one or two. And then the the drummer, uh, Sean Reiner from from Cynic took over for him. Anyways, Gene Hoagland is, the reason I like him as a metal drummer is because he has swing. Like a lot of drummers, it's very rigid. It sounds like they're lining up blocks on a conveyor yeah. belt, you know. And I mean, some of them do it very well. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm not trashing metal drumming because I love metal drumming, but. Gene Hoagland's got like a, I don't know, there's a swing to his playing that just gives it a little extra something, and I love him for it. So I would definitely steal his feet. Vinnie Paul's got the same swing that I'm talking about, so I'd say that. I would take Thomas Hack's ability to focus under pressure. I don't know how that guy plays Meshuggah songs. Like, Have you ever checked him out? A little bit, yeah. Oh, my God. Like... I'm, I have a Mashuga cover coming up in December, and I haven't tracked it yet, but I think I can do it. I don't know, but the, that, their music is just, I, I, I'm in, absolutely in awe of that band. Like, 
it, there's certain bands that come along where it's like there's a before and after, you know, like there was before the Beatles and then there's after the Beatles. There was guitar before Hendrix, there's guitar after Hendrix, and then like Eddie Van Halen. And, you know, there's like before Bowie, after Bowie, et cetera. And there's before Meshuggah and after Meshuggah. Like it's just, they're, they're, I love that band. I think they're one of the greatest things that humanity's ever produced. And uh, I think they entirely justify our existence in the universe, despite all the crap we do otherwise. <laughs> but, but yeah, Thomas Hayek is able to just take like, a, a, he's like Neil Peart on DMT. <laughs> like he's just in a whole other dimension of how he's able to wrap his mind around that stuff. And then I would think I would, I would probably take Danny Carey's hands because that guy's got like, he can play insanely fast. But he's very dynamic, very smooth. Like he's not a basher. Um, man, got to throw a little John Stanier from Helmet in there. Although I'd probably take his spine, I guess. I need a spine in there right now. I'm just a bunch of limbs and brain pile. Um, yeah, I, don't know, I think I think that's probably probably everybody whose bodies I would steal things from. I can't think of a really good looking drummer to put a face on, so I'll just keep on. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah. no you know what whatever it is about trey bledsoe that makes him able to do all that crazy stick stuff yeah. i'd steal that from him probably have to get to him in his sleep though he seems like the kind of guy who'd fight back yeah i don't know if he's anyways, sleeps either <laughs> but anyways um cool man yeah that's, that's a good, that's a good question though man that's yeah that's i probably actually i probably harvest bill bruford as well yeah but anyways awesome yeah you'd make a good dr uh, frankenstein <laughs> it'd be gross if nothing else <laughs> be very very wet just look, just look yeah. this. <laughs> oh man all right well i'm gonna um switch over to my uh job related questions and get to know you on a a more uh, workmanship level uh what are your strengths uh, I have a really, really good memory. I can learn songs extremely quickly. My personal record is I've learned 52 songs in two days. Bear in mind, it was a cover gig. These were songs I had heard a lot, but like I'd never played them. Um, you know, like Pat Benatar or some Led Zeppelin songs that I hadn't played before. Um, and so, yeah, really good memory has landed me some gigs and, and helped me keep some. Um, I mean, not recently, like the pandemic ended all of that. And then like, I you know, was doing family stuff for years, but back in my late twenties, early thirties, um, uh, I was able to get a lot of gigs simply because I could learn faster than the other guy. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, uh, I adapt very quickly, especially in a live environment, you know, like, um, and that's not that I've learned. Like the first gig I ever landed was touring with this dance funk band who like every one of the band was more talented than I was. And they knew more about that genre than I even still know. And I've definitely spent a lot of time exploring it. Like they got me hooked on stuff like Herbie Hancock or like Moa Vishnu Orchestra, stuff like that, that I just never even looked into before that. And I learned how to like play off other people and because their songs were open-ended, like it was the same arrangement, but you know, the keyboard solo might go 10 minutes one night, it might go five minutes one night and they just played off the crowd. And so they were almost like a jam band, like a structured jam band and learning how to just watch people for the signals like, OK, this part's done. We're going to the next thing and just being aware. I learned a ton from that gig. And same thing, too, like uh, paying attention to what the other players are doing. If they're soloing and say they like repeat a rhythm a couple of times, you can throw that into what you're doing and just sort of lift them up a little bit. And um, so there's that. I would say another strength I have, I feel like an asshole seeing all this stuff right now, but like, I'm, anyways, <laughs> another reason why I'm great. Uh, another thing is, is having an understanding of how the other instruments work um, is definitely helped me fit in with other musicians really easily. A big thing a lot of people don't consider. I mean, it's, it's great to learn the bass, don't get me wrong, but learning how to sing and understanding the breathing works and all of that because you start listening to the vocals and you can tell if the singer's rushing it or like having to hold notes for too long and that can really mess with them. So you start to really pay attention to the tempo for the vocal's sake and you learn why. So that's that's been good. And then 
um, I listen to, as I, you can tell from my channel, I listen to a wide variety of music. So I'm kind of like ready to go in virtually any genre, except for like, I'll, I'm 45. I'm not getting any younger. So the extreme death metal is a little out of my reach speed wise right now. But I probably fake my way through any other gig right now. Um, so there's that. Um, I generally have a pretty good sense of humor, which makes me bearable on tour and I don't snore. Um, <laughs> And uh, yeah, I guess musically, yeah, those would be my my strengths. It's just a lot of experience at this point. So nice. Well, you know, it looks like you might be uncomfortable uh, praising yourself. So I'm going to bring you down and ask you what your well, that's that's, are. that's a Canadian thing. It's yeah, well, yeah, of course I'm, it is. <laughs> we're not supposed to. Yeah. So, so yeah, list off some weaknesses. Weaknesses. Um, I mean, as a person or as a drummer, because <laughs> those are two very different things. Drumming wise, at this point, I guess sometimes I can get a little overexcited. Like if I really like the music or if my adrenaline's pumping, and I can hit a little harder than I intend to. I'm not a basher. Like I've got, I've got that very much under control, but it's there. And every once in a while, it'll slip out for like 10 seconds. You know what I mean? Uh, again, but that dance funk band, uh, they wanted a very like, I, I played like punk and heavy metal. And then I got that gig. And then I had to rein it in. And even then, I never reined it in enough. They complained about it for like a year. And then, um, uh, but I mean, I'm also 6'3 and like 190 pounds. So if I when I hit a thing, I mean, their old drummer was like four foot eight. <laughs> like come on. physics is what it is but uh weakness wise i would say other than potentially a volume issue um i've kind of hammered out a lot of my dents i mean i definitely had lots of weaknesses before I, i'm not suggesting i'm a perfect person but from a drumming standpoint like i know when to shut up i can make my way through stuff on the fly i don't need to have all of my ideas accepted you know, like I've learned how to work with people in that way where like if if I'm just for hire, then I just shut up and do what I'm told. Uh, if I'm in the band, then, yeah, I'm definitely like, well, what if we try this? I want to try that. But even then, like, I don't need them to say yes to everything I'm throwing out there because I can just go make my own records, really, if I love the idea that much. And so I don't I don't know. I probably a, at this point. My weaknesses would probably be my inability to keep my opinions to myself if I think they're funny. <laughs> I, huh. If I see a, if I see a chance to say something funny, I can't pass it up, and that that is that has definitely gotten me yelled at a couple of times. Mm. Is that a more um, recent thing? No, no, no. Like, I mean, I haven't like. Don't get me wrong. I'm not an idiot. I'm not going to embarrass somebody like in the middle of an interview or something like that. But just like in the van or something, if there's somebody like so, if something funny pops in my mind, I'll just like blurt it out. Um, but that would be about it, I think. I think, and then yeah, my other weakness would be like I, you know, I'm fast, but there are people who are faster than me. So if you're looking for like the fastest drummer ever, I'm not your guy. If you're looking for like the fourth fastest drummer ever, I might be your guy. <laughs> after a lot of like caffeine or something but uh yeah i don't know um i try not to get again like i, I really put a lot of work into fox fixing these faults so like i uh i i try to pay attention so that they don't these faults don't come back like uh, getting stuck in my ways you know what i mean like i'm always this is why i'm reshuffling stuff all the time is it's like you know, maybe it's time to try something new or maybe it's time to put myself into a place where I'm not comfortable so that I can get comfortable. And then, you know, that, that so I, I push myself into situations where I keep those faults from coming back because I can definitely get like set on an idea and then just like, that's it. That's the idea until something, you know, I butt heads with somebody on it, but that doesn't really happen anymore. Like I'm not, I'm not a super angry, pissed off 21 year old anymore. I mean, dry sarcastic middle-aged guy who's like yeah <laughs> so that's basically it what you see is what you get more or less nice <clears throat> um where do you see yourself in five years 
50. Yeah, that's a very technical. So you want more than just mathematics. <laughs> Alive. Um, let me think now. Five years. I mean, I am in my second year doing this channel now, and I have things that I want to add to it as I go along. Like, uh, first, I just wanted to get good at making it sound good and work on making it look good, which I feel I'm still, I haven't quite figured out lighting yet. Um, but part of the renovation is like right now, you see, everything's gray back there. I hate that. It drives me nuts. I just, this is why I throw movies and stuff on top of my cover size because I am so sick of the sight of that gray behind me. It's driving me nuts. So I'm going to paint that in and I haven't settled if I'm going for like a dark blue or like a really like solid red. But, uh, well, I guess we'll see. But I want to get that done, make it sound good. And then I want to start doing live streams um, once a month. Uh, I want to do a live stream. I'm not going to, I have a specific idea, but it's still a surprise. So I don't want to give it away yet. Cause I haven't seen anyone else doing it. And then, um, you know, I went on to do a longer form show, um, which I was going to launch this year and thank God I didn't, I would not have been able to keep up with the production schedule because my work life's been just a tornado of nonsense. But, uh, when things settle down a little more, I'm definitely going to bring that idea back. So five years from now, I would like to have a few more of my own albums out, hopefully selling them. I would like to be on tour playing them but i would also like to just be on tour playing forever i love being on tour uh i plan on starting teaching this year so hopefully that's still happening in five years uh i used to teach like i'm not new to it i just haven't done it for a few years and then um yeah i would hope that basically the channel becomes a place where it, it, like do you remember okay you and i are the same age so you probably remember this is like your favorite show would be on at a certain time of the week and you just you had to be there right like you you etched that into your life you know what i mean and so like for me i really like say the x files or if we're talking about music uh the, they had this thing called the power hour so once a week it was usually thursday nights i think um you had one hour where they would play heavy metal and so it was like this is what i'm doing thursday nights from seven till eight don't talk to me i'm watching heavy metal and i liked that like you know the other people that you like that did that you'd get together at school or something the next day and be like did you see the carcass video did you see the death video did you see the pantera video or whatever and i would like my channel to be like that again when i get that long form show happening is more of something you look forward to rather than just something in the the feed do you know what i mean like right yeah. now i feel like i'm this is my first year trying to adhere to a real schedule with themed days with my monday wednesday friday and it's going well. I, I, people have actually really been enjoying the, the Canadian content one, which surprised me because, A, I was surprised at how many people didn't know these bands that I just, like, they were on every day here. So it's it's literally shocking to me. Sometimes they're like, really? You don't know this? Holy crap. And then, um, but I'm the same way with people who, drummers from Central America, like uh, Manny the drummer or um, uh, Joaquin there, El Rupa, El Rupa, the cave drummer. I can't remember what it is in spanish but so it's french anyways so um yeah that's been fun is seeing people experience the canadian stuff because we have a lot of really killer bands up here I mean, a lot of countries have killer bands but it's it, i actually feel a certain level of uh, pride i guess like yeah like there's a ton of great musicians up here and it's really cool to be able to share that like i look at my my channel right now almost as more like a radio show rather than a drum channel i just happen to be using the drums as a way to share the songs like I, i'm more interested in people listening to the channel than watching me if that does that make sense yeah totally and so then you know just i am the thing the whole thing's about sharing music and i mean yeah i throw mine in there too because someone's got it but <laughs> um but I genuinely, genuinely love all of these songs that I'm doing. And it's I, I'm sharing them out of a genuine excitement. And I want to build the channel on that. So that's like, um, I, there might be a drummer guy out there doing this. I think that Samus666 guy maybe does this. But I should probably say hi to that guy. I live like 50, 20 minutes away from him. But anyways, <laughs> um, what was I going to say? Like, or that Ola uh ola from sweden there the guitar guy like he has a show every weekend and it's like it, it it's sort of uh it's less about watching him play guitar 
And it's more about sort of the immersive communal element that you used to get when everyone had to watch the TV show at the same time back in the day. It's you know what I mean? That's that's the direction I want to move in with my channel. And eventually it'd be cool to even just not have it be about me drumming all the time. It could just be about the music and have other drummers. And I'd like to start doing interviews, too, at some point. But I'm trying to take it slow. Actually, you want to talk false? Sometimes I hurry through things and I need to be more patient. And so the drum channel is an example of me literally trying to accomplish that, of being more patient. And I'm just adding like one thing a year and then throw it like that. Is that a really, is that, did I answer your question or I just ramble totally. like an idiot? No, okay, I, I love it. I, I love how, you know, it sounds like, or it might sound like rambling or, or something, but it, it seems very methodical what you want to do. You might not have it on, written down on paper, but it seems like you know what you want to do. Well, ultimately, I want to be drumming for Nine Inch Nails. So if it all leads to that, then, then we're good. Nice. Unfortunately, <laughs> the guy they've got now is just as good as I am. So I wouldn't make the situation better. Yeah. But I'd be happy. <laughs> all apologies to Elon Rubin. He's a phenomenal drummer. But <laughs> uh, but yeah, drumming for, drumming for Rush and drumming for Nine Inch Nails were my childhood goals. And Rush is obviously done. And I mean, come on, no one was going to take over for Neil. Nobody. But for Nine Inch Nails, I mean, they're still technically alive. So I still technically have that childhood dream in place. And I'm dead serious. I'd drop everything I'm doing to go drum for that guy. I could play a Nine Inch Nails show tonight and they wouldn't know that it was a new drummer. But um, but yeah, those are my those are the main goals. And then in the meantime, I'll just grow this channel. People want to hire me to play on their records. I like doing that too. Yeah. But nice. Anyway, <clears throat> just trying to, I'm just trying to take it a step at a time and not not hurry stuff so yeah nice awesome well, i have one more um job related question do you have when you look back in your life and the things you've been able to accomplish usually it uh at least in sports they like to say it takes a an army to get one guy to be a successful uh, hockey player baseball player whatever you yeah. look back and do you have any people that are mentors or people that have helped you along the way to become the musician you are yeah i mean um for all kinds of reasons uh i mean obviously there's all the drummers i've listed in this interview i mean they were hugely impactful but people in person my first drum teacher was a guy named brian mcdonald who as far as i know is a firefighter in calgary now but i haven't seen him in 30 years but he was really, really great with me when I was starting out and taught me the fundamentals and, um, pardon me, and uh, he taught me that the, the, it's what you don't play is just as important or more important than what you do play, which of course then took me another 10 years to understand, but he was the first person to tell me that. Uh, and then the next drum teacher I had a couple years later was a guy named Sean Miller who was just like a monster player like i mean that guy could do double stroke roll drum solos for like 10 minutes and not get tired it was just nuts but he taught me like latin rhythms man a lot of stuff that at the time i wasn't interested in because i was a 16 year old heavy metal guy and i didn't understand what latin could do for heavy metal um or any other genre really and so I didn't practice as hard for him as I should have. And I feel bad about it to this day because uh, he deserved a better student than what I was. But, <laughs> pardon me, he was, um, he, he got me into prog music though. Like he was actually, it was through him that I learned about Rush, that I learned about Dream Theater. He, he showed me the Images and Words records, our record. And I remember, I, I remember like hearing the song metropolis for the first time where i'm just being like whoa and uh so that that was life-changing and a lot of what he taught me really sunk in years later because again I, like as a teenager my head was basically cement and so i wasn't <laughs> like I, I was i was a typical teenager i was a full-on idiot who knew exactly what he was doing because he was an idiot and um and it's stuff that people tried to impart to me that became very important it had to sink through all that cement to get the little brain in there. And it did, it did. But at the time I was just an obnoxious ass. And so 
what Sean taught me really sunk in years later, what Brian taught me sunk in years later. Um, I had, let me think now. I mean, I've had a lot of musicians I've worked with who've just been really good and inspiring just because they're really good. You know what I mean? Like um, there was this guitarist in Winnipeg named Pat Wright, who I was in a band with for almost two years. We played, uh, we had a cover gig at this club in downtown Winnipeg. And it was a great gig. I mean, I was off stage by midnight. I had to play two sets a week and I was paying my rent. Like, I, and I just had a kid. So I was able to be home like seven days a week with my kid and still keep the lights on. It was amazing. But Pat Wright was this like really seasoned pro and like nothing through that guy. And just listening to him talk about his old gigs and stuff <laughs> really had an impact on me. From the same band, the keyboard player who was like the band leader, same as uh, Kyle, Kyle Kiernan or McKeekin or some Mennonite sounding last name. But again, wickedly talented guy, very patient with me. Um, and uh, yeah, just just watching him work again, you like he just the, the I've told my kid, like, never pass up the opportunity to learn for free. And usually the best way to do that is just like work with someone who's good at a thing and just just pay attention. And uh, I've had a lot of, I've, I've, I've been very privileged in terms of the musicians. I've been mean, able to like stand next to and sort of soak up their wisdom just by watching them do it. Um, there's a producer named Joe Silva who taught me a lot about mixing and um, programming and automation for keyboards. <laughs> um, Brett from Wilt uh, was impactful on um, being able to record myself and uh gosh i mean just about everybody i've worked with has had a positive impact on me like it's i I'd be here all day listening to them all so i'm sorry if i'm leaving anyone out but even on youtube like lindsey buffington it's the reason i started my channel i saw her play she posted this um one year of having been playing the drums i saw that video and it just it like i was in a really sort of jaded miserable place at the time and i saw this kid like just like gushing with enthusiasm for this instrument that i used to like i used to be like that and it's knocked me right out of my own bullshit basically and i completely fell in love with drumming again because of her and then i started doing the drum covers and so she definitely had a big impact and then guys like you or trey bledsoe or josh parker or matt the drummer man Joey Clark, I mean, Mike Conway, Mike Few, like throwback drummer, like Lutz and Gunter from Germany. I mean, so many channels. I know I've left people out who are going to say I'm a dick, but I'm sorry. But it's everyone who's been interacting with me on my channel has been impactful in the same way. Like, um, whether it's, you know, the sound of my videos, like Mark, the drum club guy, is another guy who's been mm -hmm. great. Um, he's offered me some advice. A guy named um, Buzzy Spiro has offered me some advice for mixing. Uh, the guy who does GD drums, he does, he's offered me advice on how to not be a dick in the comment section, um, stuff like that. Like it's everyone's been impactful. You just have to understand that they're not trying to be insulting if they're offering a criticism. You know what I mean? Sometimes they're being insulting, but it's pretty easy to tell. <laughs> and then you can just be like, Pfft. but it, usually people are just trying to help. So, and even if it doesn't work for you at least file it away in there because it might be right for you later. You know what I mean? Like, in the same way I say, never get rid of gear, never get rid of ideas. Just just make a huge pile in your brain and revisit them no matter who gave you the idea. Don't throw it away. So, no. yeah. I guess I guess that would be it. My first two drum teachers and then, like, all the musicians I've worked with since. Because <laughs> so, nice. they, they have been. Every, every musician has had an impact on me, better, good or bad. And I've learned something from it and it's made me better. So awesome. Awesome stuff. Yeah. I I'm almost exactly the same. Uh l learning from every person that I've ever played with. Uh even people that I haven't played with, people people in other bands that um have played the same show as a, as me. Like I would watch drummers all the time and learn stuff from them, pick up little things here and there. So yeah, I totally understand where you're coming from. Oh. Man. Local drummers, you just reminded me, I got to say this. Uh, there's a guy from Winnipeg named James Burton, uh, who maybe still plays in a band called Endless Chaos. I, I don't know if they're still around, 
But that guy is one of those drummers that I used to at gigs where I'm like, I don't want to go on after that guy. Because I'm just going <laughs> to embarrass myself because he is he's phenomenal. Another guy from town is uh, Derek Kroll, who plays in the band Votov. And he plays for a few other people whose names are eluding me right now. Scott something or other. This Scott Kroger, Kroger, Krieger. Again, another Mennonite last name. But a wicked guitar player. Uh, but yeah, uh, Derek is one of those drummers. That same thing. If if I was ever at the same gig as him, it's like, okay, I got to bring my A game just so I don't look crappy next to this guy. Um, and then, yeah, those would be the two big ones, I think, from Winnipeg. I'm probably missing somebody, and I'm going to hear about it later. <laughs> but, but yeah, those two guys, again, local drummers, you just watch them, and good or bad, you're going to learn something from all of them. And those two guys, like the kind where you're like writing notes, where you're like, okay, how the heck did he did that? Did he do the double kick thing? Uh, James Burden's got some of the fastest feet I've ever heard in my life. But uh, anyways, being from um, Winnipeg, are you are you into or heard of uh, Propagandi? I uh, I used to rehearse across the hall from them actually. Uh, I'm very familiar with them. I've played a number of their songs. I'm not actually a fan. Like the punk thing, I went through kind of a backwards musical evolution compared to a lot of people. Like um, I didn't get into the really heavier stuff until I was way older. Like most people are into like death metal and punk or the more what used to be the extreme ends of things when they were teenagers. And I like I definitely got into prog and I liked some industrial music, but I liked the industrial music more for the sci-fi element of it more than anything else. I didn't really get into like death metal until I was in my thirties. And then I discovered morbid angel and I'm like, where have you been all my life? <laughs> um, and I didn't. Um, so I went kind of backwards in that regard, but I did play in a lot of metal and punk bands because I had the ability rather than the desire. And I mean, I, and it was fun because I remember I said, the drums has the, the it, it works at the level of emotional intensity that I have as a person. So heavy metal was just like, oh, this is just fun for me, even though I don't really care about the music necessarily at the time. And so with Propagandy, like starting out of punk bands, we like they were standard fare. Like them and Operation Ivy were two of the bands that we learned. Like I think there might have been some of the first songs I ever learned uh, in like um, grade 10 or something like that. And then uh they have just sort of come in and out of my life but like the punk thing never really landed with me other than the buzzcocks i like them but um so the pro so propaganda is like like i know them like they're just around town um and again i used to be in the same building as them to rehearse back when i was in will but that's about it i think they they had one i don't know if they have the same drummer at the time like i, I don't know enough about that but their drummer they had an album called Potemkin, Potemkin City Limits that I got when I was working. I was a newspaper editor way back when in university. And I did music journalism and edited the paper and whatnot. And so I used to get records in the mail all the time. And I remember getting their Potemkin City Limits album and actually digging it. The drumming was really good. There were the he, drummer used to do what this guitarist friend of mine called helicopter drum fills, which were just the like, you know, right left kick kick right left kick kick right you know those like yeah i don't know if you hear that but yeah <laughs> and then um so there's a lot of that but yeah that's about it for me and propaganda i uh i don't think i even own that record anymore my daughter might have taken it anyways <laughs> she took the record collection so which is good it was for her but most of my music's at her house now so, anyways nice all right. Well, I'm going to quickly go to some speed dating questions, uh, try to get these over with, because I know we're, we've been on for a little bit and I don't want to spend too much of your day. I don't even know what time it is. <laughs> yeah. I'm talking to you on my clock, so I have no idea what time uh, it is. Yeah. Come uh, on, clock, yeah, man. Like 1220. So we've been on for an hour and 20 minutes, I guess. Oh, wow. Something like that. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, no, I mean, Time's been flying by for me, but uh, yeah. So speed dating questions, questions you might find at a speed dating event. Are you a meat eater or a vegetarian? Meat eater. Nice. Any uh, favorites? I like, well, I mean, chicken. Yeah, I put chicken on anything, but I do like a, a nice rare steak or a filet mignon, though I don't eat them often. Chicken is a regular part of my life. Beef isn't, but only because of its availability and cost. 
not because I don't like it. Nice. Oh, and bacon. Oh man, bacon. <laughs> <I> love... <laughs> All right. Um hot bath or a shower? Sorry? You, you prefer a hot shower. bath or a shower? Oh, shower. Definitely. I don't want to lay in my own filth all day. <laughs> Plus, I need to find a bathtub that fits me. Like, I'm usually in there crumpled up into a ball. So shower all the way. Yeah. I, I, who did I just, I asked somebody this, and I think probably every time uh, I, I've interviewed a guy, it's always shower. I don't know any guys that, that like to take baths. I think baths are a girl thing. Yeah. And we love you. We love you for it. But I think it's a girl thing. Anyway. <laughs> uh beer or wine? Wine. Wine. All right. Any Red. favorite wines? Red. Hmm? Any uh, favorites? I've actually I've avoided beer my entire life. Oh, I mean wow. I've, I've had sips because people keep trying to sell it to me, but just never got into beer, cigarettes, or coffee. Are you and, are you uh, are you really Canadian? Hmm? Are you really Canadian? No beers? Yeah. Oh yeah. Wow. Oh. I say A a lot. I listen to Rush, so there you go. <laughs> and I can read. <laughs> um, do you like to do camping or go to hotels? Uh, well, a hotel, I guess, but I don't hate camping. I just okay. haven't done much of it recently. Uh, dogs or cats? Cats, but I have both. Okay. Uh, how many of each? I have one dog and three cats. Although the, the dog and two of the cats are my mom's because she moved in with me last year because she needs full-time help. She has Parkinson's, which I would not recommend. And <laughs> uh, so I, I, it's a large part of my work is just taking care of her. But she has a golden retriever and two cats. And then I've got a little cat who's actually just sitting behind the camera watching me talk to you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, so the three cats and a dog. Sorry. I'm sorry for laughing, but I know you, you told me you have a dark sense of humor and I kind of do too, so I I get it, but I just wanted to totally. put it out there. I'm not laughing at your mom's Parkinson's. I didn't think you were. I didn't think you were. Okay, so do you have a favorite movie? Oh God, yeah, I have a million favorite movies, but I'll narrow it down to a couple: Casablanca, uh, Blade Runner, and anything by Stanley Kubrick. Nice. Except for Eyes Wide Shut, that movie was god awful. But 2000, <laughs> 2001, The Shining, or Full Metal Jacket are three movies I could watch every day for the rest of my life and not get bored. But Casablanca and Blade Runner are my two all time favorites. Nice. And then there's like a probably 500 movies tied for 30. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Same here. Uh, what's your biggest pet peeve? Oh, people who whistle. Really? I can't handle, I can't handle whistling. <laughs> I just can't. I just like I the Karen comes out of me and I'm like, excuse me, could you stop that? Um, like I'll put up with a lot, but whistling just man, that just instantly makes me angry. Um, and then people who snore, but at the same time, most people who snore are usually commenting about it, so I'll meet them halfway and not murder them in their sleep. But um that's really only an issue on like, touring. It's not in my personal life or anything, but it's just there's been a couple of tours where, we're, like, I've been rooming with a guy who has snored so loud that you're just like, "What are you trying to sleep?" <laughs> so, and I like my sleep. I, if I don't get my sleep, I'm not me when I haven't had my sleep. Let's put it that way. There's, there's a weakness for you. When I'm tired, <laughs> I am a bitch. <laughs> How many hours but, do you uh, need? Sorry. How many hours do you need? Uh, I can function with 45 minutes, but I can function and be pleasant with six hours. <laughs> okay. God. Um, do you, are you the type to stick to a routine or do you like to go with the flow routine i mean my routine gets disrupted every day because of uh, like work and you know the responsibilities looking after ma there but generally speaking i try to stick to a routine because if i don't it's very easy for me to sink into a state of you know what i'm gonna smoke a joint and watch cartoons for 12 hours and I can justify that to myself. And I shouldn't be able to justify that. So I, if I stick to a routine, which I generally do, I practice and do all my filming first thing in the morning. Like I roll out of bed and start filming covers. So I got bed head in every video. And then work out and then have lunch. And then everything for the rest of the day is, is you know, uh, work stuff. And um, I try to stick to that. But sometimes life gets in the way. And then I usually get really irritated. But 
I chew on it and keep quiet about it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> how would your best friend describe you? The nicest asshole you'd ever meet. I believe I was described that way once. <laughs> I believe it was my best friend who said that. It's a good uh, description. <laughs> emphasis on the nicest, though. The, 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 the asshole part just comes from the fact that, like, you're being an idiot. I'll just be like, you're being an idiot. Like, I'll just tell you. But also, if you're being awesome, I'll tell you you're being awesome. So I, I consider it fair, but other people don't. So they just want to hear that they're awesome. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I guess that would be about it. Yeah. Or just like I do the fallback funny. I, people probably describe me as light to moderately amusing. <laughs> nice. Uh, Coke or Pepsi? Oh. Uh, Jones root beer these days, but it was Pepsi for a long time, longer than it should have been, quite frankly. <clears throat> Are you, uh, you like to try to eat healthy? Try being the operative word, but yeah, I, I used to like, I mean, it depends on whether or not I've been smoking weed, which is the only drug I've really imbibed in. I've, I've avoided all the heavy ones my whole life and I will continue to avoid them, but I do get the munchies and man, all down like, all down way too much crap when I have the munchies. But when I don't have the munchies, I generally try to eat pretty nice. Like I, I've gotten into baking and cooking over the last uh, couple of years. So a lot of my stuff is made at home. So if I'm making with good ingredients. I'm not buying like ready-made stuff that you just tear the thing off, and put it in the microwave. Uh, although when I was in university, I mean, good God, I basically just ate plastic crap for like a decade. But since about my late thirties or so, I really tried to try being the operative word to eat right. Try, <laughs> fail, try, fail. Anyway, uh, have you traveled anywhere fun or exciting lately? Yes, not lately. No, I haven't been anywhere since twenty nineteen, thanks to uh, that. That show will not be named on the internet, apparently. Mm -hmm. But prior prior to that. Yeah, I traveled a bunch. I've been to Japan, which I loved, loved Japan. Um, other than the way they treat sea life, I've got nothing bad to say about that country. Super nice people. Uh, I've been to Thailand, loved that country, entirely different set of reasons. I would live in Japan. I wouldn't live in Thailand, but I would visit it again. It was, it was, it was nice. Um, managed to see the entire country except for Phuket, which is fine because it's just a tourist trap anyways. Um, and then all of the UK... Way, the Wales is one of the most beautiful countries I've ever been to. That's where my family is partly from uh, to begin with. And the rest of it's from France, which I only learned last year. And then um, uh, I've been to Berlin. Berlin was the last place I went. Uh, my ex-wife had family there, so we were over visiting. And Berlin's amazing. Uh, there's no German people in it, and uh, which is fine, because German people don't have senses of humor. They fight me in the street, Vanessa. Anyway um but yeah berlin was was lovely um i didn't see the rest of the country unfortunately i really wanted to but that was the last place i went but mostly between 2007 and 2019 the only places i went were in minneapolis and chicago uh, and that was to see concerts because we don't well we do better now that we have an arena downtown even though it's not really the nicest arena but um there's more concerts happening south of the border for for us so um I we'd usually go like twice, three times a year. I'd be in Minneapolis or Chicago to see a show. Um, that's where most of my childhood went. And those cities used to be really cool. So <laughs> not so much now, but five, six years ago, yeah, they were lovely. And I, I actually genuinely saddened by how they've turned out. Because I really liked going there. Again, everyone in Chicago was super nice. Everyone in Minneapolis was super nice. And now everyone's on fire. <laughs> so, try to have a conversation with someone who's on fire it's boring it's all <laughs> help me where's the exit and i'm like come on man tell me tell me about you anyways nice did you did you used to drive down there or would you yeah well, how long yeah. did that drive an eight hour well if you really give her it's about a seven hour drive to minneapolis from winnipeg and it's about 14 to 15 hours to chicago <laughs> and we usually do that in a day just like Chicago in one day, get there the day before the concert, hang out in the town. And then like 
take a couple of days to hang out if we want. Like last time I was there was to see Dream Theater when they were doing their Images and Words 20, this was in 2017. So it had been their 25th anniversary tour, I guess. And uh, I took my daughter to the show uh, to see them. And we spent like three days there. It was awesome. We got front row seats. Like I had like way up in the balcony seats. And one of the fan club members didn't show up. So they had this empty seat. And one of the ushers thought my daughter looked cool because she had a leather jacket and an Iron Maiden shirt. She is cool. But um, <laughs> they asked her, like, hey, do you want to sit in the front row? And I'm immediately like, yes. <laughs> like, didn't, she didn't even answer. I was like, yes. <laughs> and then we ended up down there. And I'm like three feet away from John Petrucci just <laughs> watching the whole show as they're playing one of my favorite records from start to finish. Mike Mangini was close enough. I probably could have thrown my daughter at him and she would have actually hit him, but it was a great show. But yeah, Chicago, man, I loved Chicago. I loved that city. Nice. Anyway. Awesome. Well, um, yeah, I, I, I think I've got a way better sense of who uh, Mike Lewis is after our little talk here. I hope you guys do too. Um, is there anything that you wanted to just, get off your chest or talk about the community or whatever before we uh, close this thing out. I miss Matt from drum man. I wish he'd come back. I, I liked him when he did those five stroke at five episodes and when the interviews, man, it said felt the same since he took his hiatus. So I hope he's doing okay. Other than that, people need to start listening to albums again. I know I sound like an old man yelling at a cloud, but <laughs> the, sh the, 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 the streaming shuffle thing needs to stop. And you people need to like put on a CD or a vinyl and just like treat yourself for 40 whole minutes and look at the cover art and just kind of like, like I get that music can be a background thing. It is for me too. I'm not like, I don't just sit down and listen to records, but I just, I feel like people need to start taking music a little more seriously again and respecting it. And it, cause it was disrespected for a long time by musicians and by the industry and it got devalued and people stopped caring. And now we have Machine Gun Kelly and, uh, or, you know, whatever. And so, yeah, people need to start like treating it with respect again, but it, you know, the people making it and presenting it need to do that as well. And they need, we need to like earn back that sort of public trust and affection that music used to have. Like, cause when I was a kid, you didn't think twice about buying an, uh, an album. You just, you went and got it. Your band put out a new record. You, you went and got it. You weren't like, oh, I'll grab it here. I'll get it there. I mean, yeah, some people would get me to like, I had a two cassette thing. So I would copy stuff for people. But I feel like the act of listening to music and watching live shows has kind of been devalued to the level of like going to 7-Eleven. And uh, I don't know, that needs to be fixed because I don't, I can't prove it, but I do think that like when people started just streaming music like 15 years ago or whatever, that's when society really started going to crap. I think music was the glue that kept us all from killing each other. And I think without it now, uh, well, you look at the state of things now. Prove me wrong. <laughs> I mean, there are other economic factors, sure. But, uh, but yeah, I think music needs to be treated with dignity and respect again. That's my old man rant for that. Yeah, I and mean, that's I, what all I have to complain about. I I can't say I, I disagree. I mean, yeah, gone are the times. Definitely, where you would just listen to albums, and now it's just I don't even think like I, my cousin has a band and she's touring around and whatnot, and I don't think she's put out an album. She's put out an EP, mm -hmm. and then normally what she does is just put out a single here and there, and it's just like. Wow, that's that's how things are now. It's crazy. Well, what I hate is when you see people talking about that and they're like, well, I guess this is how we do it now. And it's like, but it doesn't have to be. Yeah. Like, you can change and <laughs> I can change and everyone can change and cue the Rocky speech. But it's like, I, like I'm still putting out albums. Like this fall, I'm putting out a, an EP, but that's because it's a, a covers. From the, do you remember the old Transformers movie from 1986? The, yeah, the first know. animated one? I don't it's, know if I ever watched it. It's the most insane kids movie ever made. I can't believe they got away with it. Like <laughs> it's it's ultra violent and the dialogue is actually shockingly good. And the animation, it's all hand drawn. It's just beautiful. But the soundtrack is like this crazy techno prog music. Like it sounds like the 1970s, but from like the 2270s. It's by this guy named Vince DiCola. And even as a kid, I was like completely enamored with this stuff. 
And so I finally am putting out an EP of my favorite stuff from that soundtrack. Uh, and that's what I'm finishing the synthesizers on upstairs. And uh, that's what's going to come out in October. But then the next thing I'm putting out is an album of my stuff. And that'll be a full like 60 minute record. There's three 20 minute songs on it. And uh, it's got everything from country to blast beats to ambient, like, you know, whale sound keyboards, like when you're getting a massage or something. <laughs> and um, it goes places. I'm very excited to finish that one, actually. But yeah, I mean, albums, I'm not, people can laugh about it or call me old fashioned. It's not going to change anything. I think, like, why would you read a chapter of a book? Like, yeah. read the whole book. You know what I mean? Not necessarily in one sitting, but I mean, watch the whole movie. Why would you just watch one scene? You know what I mean? Why would you just put out one scene? So these people putting out singles and songs, it's like, it's their thing. They can do what they want. But uh, what bugs me is that the more, just the way society works, the more people say that, the more people will just accept it. And then, you know, in the same way that audio quality has diminished since the 90s, I mean, I loved vinyl for the experience of listening to it. Cause I, and again, being your age, like I'm sure you can relate. We're lucky enough to experience that in the big cover art and all that. I love that. But CDs sound fantastic. That's undeniable. And I love them. And then MP3s, it's like, okay, I get the convenience. I'm just as guilty. I'm talking to you on a phone that has like 2000 songs in it right now. But I know like the, the good from bad because I was lucky enough to be born back when good was just the standard mm -hmm. and so these people who are growing up on Spotify like, you don't even know what you're missing and you don't care because you're not getting the good stuff it's 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 like being able to eat like you know a freshly made homemade meal versus something that came out of a styrofoam container off a conveyor belt in the back of a McDonald's you know and streaming is the McDonald's part of that and I mean again I understand the convenience I get it but people really need to sort of look beyond that, start giving themselves the experience instead of the convenience. But I don't know. I would. I wish that more musicians would just like Stephen Wilson. I think still pushes that the guy from Porcupine Tree. Um, and there are a lot of people I think are still behind albums as a thing, and and I still am. Yeah, but I wish the industry would like get together and start. <laughs> Start going back to when music was music. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Old man yells at cloud. <laughs> nice. Well, uh, yeah, I just, um, I'm glad you were able to to make it today. I'm, I'm happy that you came on and uh, I don't really have anything else to add either. So I just want to say thank you. Um, Thanks for having me. Anyone watching this, please, if you haven't already, go check out Mike's channel. It's It's an amazing very unique channel and it's in five years going to be an awesome uh can't miss channel <laughs> well this already is but in five theory, years is going to be even more <laughs> in theory i will have a popular channel <laughs> a laser anyway thanks for having me on though i really appreciate it yeah man mike lewis is gonna bring music back i know it <laughs> yeah just me yeah right <laughs> you so gotta do start it again it. I'll do it again. Alrighty. Cool, man. Well, uh, thanks for having, uh, thanks for coming on and I will, uh, see you around for sure. Wicked. All righty. Take care. Yep. Hey, if you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you get notified every time I put out a new video. Also check out my website, www.kmkdrum.com, kmkandrum.com. And if you really, really want, head on over to my Patreon, link in the description. I've got a ton of benefits for anyone who becomes a patron, a lot of cool extra content that you can't find here on YouTube. And also, check out these cool videos that I've done in the past, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.